This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Agents of Mayhem, Pride of Babylon. Agents of Mayhem, Pride of Babylon was released in 2019 by Academy Games and designed by Gunter Eichert. This game supports 2-4 to four players and takes 1-2 to two hours to play. As we discussed in the last episode, Agents of Mayhem uses a square-based mapping system. Miniatures can move in any direction, vertical or horizontal across lines, and diagonally across symbols. Line and symbol types dictate the movement point cost, or in some cases, prohibit movement altogether. Now let's go deeper into the movement rules to understand how all this works. Obviously, while playing the game, the moving miniature may encounter other miniatures on the map. When this occurs, there may be additional movement costs and restrictions. Miniatures are classified as either friendly or enemy units. A miniature may move through a space containing another friendly unit. However, it may not end its movement in the friendly miniature's space. Movement around enemy units is much more complicated. A moving miniature may never enter or pass through the space of an enemy unit. They must also pay more for movement in the enemy miniature's zone of control. Zone of control is the space an enemy unit occupies and the eight spaces surrounding it. However, an enemy miniature's zone of control does not pass through walls or extend to floor levels above it or below it. Moving between spaces in an enemy's zone of control costs three movement points. This cost is not cumulative. Therefore, a miniature entering a space with an obstacle in an enemy unit's zone of control would only cost three movement points, not six. Movement costs are easy to remember because everything costs either one movement point or three movement points. For a player to move their miniature on the game map, they need to select an action. For our first example, let's look at Hollywood's sprint action. To sprint, first the player pays the action cube cost. The cost is indicated by an open hand symbol and the colored cube symbol above it. Sprint costs one green action cube. Therefore, the player removes one green action cube from their elite player board's well and places it back into the general supply. This leads us to the hash square icon next to the cost. This icon tells the player the number of movement points they can spend. As you may remember, one clear line or clear symbol costs one movement point to cross. Therefore, the miniature can move across nine of these to enter a new space. It's important to note that with each move, the miniature can change its facing. When entering a new space, the flat edge of the miniature's base must be flush to one of the lines in the space. The flexibility to change a miniature's facing with every space they move into allows players to easily navigate them across the map. Next, let's discuss jumping. Jump allows a miniature to propel themselves vertically and then out across the map. Jump is an add-on action which means it can be combined with sprint. Therefore, the sprint action's movement can be interrupted to jump and then continue sprinting again. The layout of the jump panel on the Elite Unit Board is similar to other action panels, with the exception of new icons in the movement point space. The up arrow indicates the height of the jump in levels. The curved arrow indicates the length of the jump. When a miniature like Hollywood jumps, they rise up one level and are able to move across four spaces on the map. The advantage of jumping is that the arc of the jump allows the miniature to avoid obstacles in their path. However, obstacles can only be ignored on levels the miniature is jumping above. For example, while the Hollywood miniature can ignore the obstacles on the first level, the obstacle on the roof cannot be ignored. Therefore, Hollywood cannot jump across the obstacles on the roof to land in the center. Finally, let's talk about dashing. The dash action allows a miniature to move one space on the map for the cost of one green and one yellow action cube. While this may seem expensive for just one space, the advantage of dash is that it is an instant action. 
which means that it can be used anytime during the game. Therefore, if a player finds their miniature in a bad spot on the map, they can conduct an instant action to move to a safer position. Dash is also useful in that it can be conducted before the attacker rolls the dice. This forces the attacker to recalculate their attack based on the miniature's new position. Dash is also useful if a miniature is pushed off a building into an uncontrolled fall. Dash can then be used to turn an uncontrolled fall into a controlled fall and land safely. As you can see, while Dash is expensive, the uses of Dash make up for this cost. Every elite unit board has a unique weapon action that is the unit's main way to attack. Weapon action panels have the following features. At the top of the panel is the weapon's name and the action type. On the left side of the panel is the weapon action's cube cost. Next to this is the weapon's attack range, symbolized by the range symbol and followed by three colored spaces. Each colored space icon represents the range in spaces of the attack. These colors are also tied to the dice used at that particular range. The first red symbol is for close range. This assault rifle has a close range of four spaces that will allow the use of custom 12-sided dice. This continues into mid-range, which is five to eight spaces away and uses the yellow eight-sided dice. And finally, long range, at a maximum of 12 spaces away, spaces 9 through 12 would use white six-sided dice. Beside the three attack range icons is another icon that tells the player the number of attack dice to roll. And beneath this is a movement point icon. Most weapon actions allow movement either before or after the attack. However, the movement points from a weapon action may not be broken up like in other movement actions. It's either attack and move, or move and then attack. Finally, each weapon has one or more abilities. These abilities use a number of unique icons. The symbology used is defined by the rule summary sheet included in the game and page 23 at the end of the basic rules section. This particular weapon, the assault rifle, shows the word jump with an equal symbol and a blue cube symbol with a down arrow. This means if the main assault rifle action is paired with a jump action, then after the jump is complete, the unit gains a blue cube. Now that we understand how the main weapon works, we're going to walk through the steps of an attack. An attack is made up of three parts. Part one, choosing a target, Part 2, rolling the attack dice, and Part 3, applying the attack results. Let's begin with the first phase of an attack, choosing the target. When targeting with a miniature, select a space containing a targetable object. This can be another miniature, or objective, or event markers if referenced in a scenario. All eligible targets must meet three requirements. First, the target must be in front of the attacker. Spaces surrounding a miniature fall into two categories. Front spaces, which I've marked in green, and flank spaces, which I've marked in red. Front spaces include all spaces forward of a unit's facing and an adjacent space on each side of the miniature. Flank spaces fall behind the miniature and fill out the remaining spaces on a miniature's sides. The second requirement of an eligible target is it must be within the miniature's line of sight. Line of sight, or LOS, essentially means the attacker must be able to see its target to conduct an attack. To determine this, trace an imaginary line from the closest corner dots between the attacker and the potential target. If there are multiple corner dots of equal length from the attacker to the potential target, then the attacker may choose either one. When tracing this line, it cannot pass through a wall, the edge lines and corner dots of openings like doors and windows, or the floor or roof of a level. If a line passes through any of these, the attacker's line of sight is blocked, which means they can't see the target. Also be aware of the plateau effect. This occurs when a unit is on a higher level but is standing away from the edge. 
When this occurs, the attacker, who is on a lower level, cannot see the target from their position. As the rulebook points out, since only buildings block line of sight, you should be able to intuitively tell by eye if an attack has clear line of sight. However, with all that said, here are some additional notes on line of sight to keep in mind. Line of sight can be traced through the obstacle corner dots at the corner of a building. Line of sight can also be traced along a wall as long as it does not cross the wall itself. However, line of sight cannot be traced between openings and from the edge of the roof up and down the same wall face. Also be aware that attacks can be made from and to the cover corner dots of an opening. Otherwise, attacks cannot be made between inside and outside spaces. Now, let's move on to the next step. For the third requirement, the potential target must be within the attacker's range. Many of the weapons in this game have pretty long range, so to illustrate this and keep it on one slide, I'm going to use Hardtack's shotgun. Like we discussed earlier, the distance and squares to a target fall into specific range categories. Close range in red, mid range in yellow, and long range in white. All three of these colored ranges correspond to the color of the die rolled to attack. When you map out the shotgun's range, you can see that close range in red falls into the front spaces surrounding the attacker. Mid range in yellow extends two to three spaces away, and far range in white extends further from four to seven spaces away. Anything beyond this is marked in black, which means the target would be out of range and not eligible to attack. So basically, as long as the desired target is to the front of the attacker, within line of sight, and within one of these colored ranges, they're an eligible target. Now before we move on to rolling the attack dice, let's quickly cover some exceptions. Weapons with colored ranges that do not have a number are ignored. On occasion, you will find colored ranges on weapons in a different order. For example, the sniper trooper rolls white for short range, red for mid range, and yellow for long range. If you think about it, this makes sense. A sniper's attacks are designed for long range. Therefore, close proximity targets can be harder to hit for a sniper, and so on. Finally, some attacks do not require dice to be rolled. This is known as a diceless range. These will typically only have a single range for the area of effect. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk about rolling dice to conduct the attack. Agents of Mayhem, Pride of Babylon, has three types of custom dice with special symbols. White six-sided dice, yellow eight-sided dice, and red 12-sided dice. The basic concept with these dice is that the more sides they have, the better they are. Now, all of these three dice types share four basic symbols. Let's walk through them. First of all, like many games of this type, when a die is rolled and a symbol comes up, that symbol's effect is immediately inflicted on the target. If a blank side is rolled on the die, then it's no effect or a miss. Now let's talk about each symbol. A hit symbol inflicts damage on a unit. The next symbol is an aimed hit. Aimed hits cause damage just like regular hits, but may also provide an aim bonus. For aim hits to receive this bonus, the attacker must pay an extra yellow focus cube to aim. Aimed attacks can grant various bonuses, which are explained in the advanced rules section. A push result forces the target one movement point, essentially one space, away from the attacker. However, a unit cannot be pushed over an obstacle edge line or corner dot unless three push results are used. Also, if push sends a target off a ledge, then they're in an uncontrolled fall. Roll 1d12 for each level that unit falls. Only use the hits and aimed hits to determine damage from the fall. Ignore any push or special result symbols. Finally, the target may use a dash action any time during their fall to turn an uncontrolled fall into a controlled fall. This is known as a fall dash. The special symbol activates special effects listed on the weapon action, gadget cards, and upgrade tiles. 
each of the unit's special effects requires its own special result to use. Each special effect may also be used only once per attack roll. Hit and aimed hit die results impact the cubes on an elite unit board. We covered this in the first episode, but here's a quick reminder. Cubes are removed from wells when taking actions or receiving damage. They may be regenerated back after a period of rest, exactly like the stat bars in a video game. However, whenever a character receives damage, red wound cubes are applied. First to defenses, removing shields and then armor, and after that they begin impacting and remaining in action and mayhem wells. The player gets to decide which of these wells to place the cubes in. Be aware though, red wound cubes prevent regeneration and using attributes to their full ability. And once these red wound cubes equal the health stat, then the character is overwhelmed and removed from the game. Now, let's discuss how dice can be modified with attack bonuses and attack penalties. An attacker receives two attack bonuses for the following situations. First, the attacker receives a bonus for attacking from a space in the target's flank. This provides two attack bonuses. And second, for attacking from a higher level than the level the target is on. This also provides two attack bonuses. Each attack bonus allows a unit to upgrade one dice in their pool by one level. Therefore, a white D6 would be upgraded to a yellow D8, and a yellow D8 is upgraded to a red D12, and a red D12 upgrade adds an additional D6 to the dice pool. In a similar fashion, certain situations can penalize the attacker. An attacker receives two penalties for each of the following. If the attacker's line of sight is traced to an obstacle or cover dot of the target space, this imposes two attack penalties. And if attacking from a lower level than the level the target is on, this imposes two attack penalties. Attack penalties work in the reverse order of bonuses. For each attack penalty, a red D12 is downgraded to a yellow D8. A yellow D8 is downgraded to a white D6 and a white d6 is removed from the dice pool. And yes, enough penalties can actually result in no dice being rolled. Now, when both attack bonuses and attack penalties are in effect, they cancel each other out on a one-to-one -one basis. Any remaining attack bonuses or attack penalties are then applied. Finally, let's discuss some other combat features. Let's begin with health packs. If an attacker inflicts one point of damage on a target and they receive two special die results, then they may remove one wound cube from the attacker's wells. Some characters have a block instant action. By paying one yellow focus cube and one blue tech cube, that unit may ignore one hit. This ability may be used any number of times after the attack roll is made and any special results used. Keep these rules in mind when conducting combat in the game. This wraps up our second episode for Agents of Mayhem Pride of Babylon from Academy Games and Apollo Games. In the next episode we will finalize the basic rules by learning about squad unit boards, gadgets, and status effects. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.